Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Jing Fa Chen uh, from the University of British Columbia. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome all of you here at, in our beautiful city and uh, with such a uh, very gorgeous weather. Uh, you really bring a uh, wonderful weather to, to us because just a few days ago we have been troubled by a very <laughs> many, 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 many days of rain and uh, you, uh, your arrivals and or maybe also this event uh, made that the Buddha <laughs> to do us this favor uh, by blessing us with such wonderful weather. So thank you all and I also really appreciate that you're taking time uh, taking the trouble to uh, travel from different corners on world uh, to come to here and also dividing the fatigue uh, of long distance travels uh, arrive here and start to work immediately. <laughs> I uh, must apologize for this but we are having a very very tight schedule uh, we have uh, 27 or 28 papers, right? And, uh, uh, and also uh, we uh, we have uh, several uh, panelists who, uh, because of different reasons, couldn't be here physically, but they will try to Skype in or Blue Jean. And also, we have a, a very, very uh, different type of dedications. And also, of course, we can see that we are now already benefit from the technologies <laughs> by, uh, a, yeah, by a uh, using uh, Skype or the blue jeans and uh, we will be able to do some things that we are not be able to do. And but of course, uh, as you can see uh, from the uh, programs, we also have uh, quite a few papers. Uh, uh, we have, uh, I think we have a panel also, uh, particularly on the, uh, how technologies have already been uh, advanced in the uh, uh, a Buddhist study on this uh, past several decades. So uh, the themes of this uh, a conference uh, actually uh, tell us quite a lot about the uh, historical uh, backgrounds and uh, uh, current uh, challenges that uh, we have uh, for the, uh, the relationships between Buddhism and technologies because of maybe the perceptions that the Buddhism has really uh, negative uh, ideas about it, uh, about it, uh, external world. People usually believe that Buddhism is very have a lot of to do, have nothing to do, uh, or, or even maybe have many things to to do against uh, technologies. This probably is, uh, I think that is also an illusion. Uh, as we can see, uh, Buddhism actually is very very uh, deeply involved in uh, in 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 the. Uh, technologies. But ironically, uh, we also find that uh, technologies actually also pre uh, presents uh, great deals of uh, challenges or even uh, disasters uh, to human societies. So we we'll see that how Buddhism may uh, respond to all these uh, technologies uh, related uh, disasters. So uh, we have uh, uh, a lot of to uh, to present uh, in the coming two and a half days, and uh, a, but today uh, we uh, would like to start our, our conference with a keynote speech uh, from Professor uh, Tim Ballast. Uh, <laughs> uh, all right, uh, it's the day, and maybe well, of course, maybe many of you already, uh, already know him. Uh, if not, uh, it's, it's a his personally, but also, yeah, you definitely know his work. Uh, professor Tim Bailey is currently a professor at uh, Emeritus of the London University, uh, SOAS. So he has been doing a great deal on, uh, yeah, a great deal of work on uh, painting uh, in medieval time, uh, East Asia, particularly the Buddhism role in uh, promoting, if not uh, uh, promoting, uh, uh, painting technologies in East Asia. Uh, and he's also, but today he is not going to talk about this uh, specifically. He is going to uh, talk about how uh, uh, something related to Lidan. <laughs> so uh, please uh, welcome uh, Professor uh, Barrett. 
Okay, um, it's so good to be back here at the City Foundation. Um, and um, very good to be at such a, a groundbreaking conference. Um, I, I've been asking around a bit, and I don't know that there's ever been a conference with quite the spread that we have here. And, and in fact, a lot of people won't know each other, because although, uh, as Jim Hwan has said, there are, there are uh, Buddhism's relation to technology is an interesting and important issue, uh, broadly conceived. The ways to approach that um, differ uh, quite radically, and so a lot of you will be working in very different areas. You won't necessarily know my work at all. I'm a historian, as he said, um, and in fact, the opening papers are going to be um, well, um, it's historical, um, as uh, someone once said, the past is prologue. Um, does anybody know who said that? I would imagine it would be Karl Marx or someone like that, right? Um, but it was actually William Shakespeare. Um, uh, so, but anyhow, this so this session is going to be the past as prologue, um, and. Um, uh, the way I'm approaching it is to uh, look at uh, the area that you would probably go to to find out about Buddhism and technology if you were interested in the history of East Asia in particular. Um, because uh, what I'm going to tell you is that that won't work particularly well, and in fact, as it were, there's everything to play for in this area too, uh, because the work hasn't been done in any comprehensive way at all. Um, therefore, uh, the person I have to start with is this uh, Joseph Needham. Now, I guess at least some of you will be aware of uh, the work of Joseph Needham, right? Yes? Hands up. <laughs> okay, enough. Uh, uh, and, and his work on science and civilization in China. Uh, it, it's a massive uh, multi-volume compilation that, he, that uh, during his life he initiated and was carried out uh, not only by uh, him but by collaborators and, and is still, um, I think, ongoing, although it's more or less complete. Um, and it produced a huge amount of information uh, covering uh, science and civilization, not only in China but more broadly uh, in, in East Asia. Uh, and one would expect, therefore, um, as the, the pioneering and by far the largest work in its field, uh, that, that this would be uh, where you would go and um, start to learn about the background to, to the development of the relationship between Buddhism and technology in China, um, at least. The reason why you won't actually find it that useful um, is something that I've found that I have been quoted about in Wikipedia. Now, uh, as, as I point out in my remarks, one day all of you, sooner or later, will find yourself quoted in Wikipedia. I can just about guarantee that as it expands further and further to incorporate the whole of human knowledge, you, will you too will be swept up in it. Uh, and so and that, that was not quite as disconcerting as to find myself actually quoted in Wikipedia on the relationship between um, Buddhism and technology in, in the work of, and thought of Joseph Needham in the relevant. I can't remember if it's in the Needham entry or in the Science and Civilization in China entry, but anyhow, there I am. Um, this is disconcerting anyhow because I don't expect people to take me seriously. Um, I, I mainly work you know, for my own interest um, rather than because I've got any message for humanity. Um, and um, uh, so I'm disconcerted to start with. I'm also slightly disconcerted, not because my remarks are taken out of context. And I must say that my experience with Wikipedia is that it doesn't really do that. If it, uh, you know, it tries to avoid doing that. Obviously, any uh, sort of synthetic work of this type has, has got to sort of pull stuff from here and there and present it in a way uh, that um, is going to be slightly problematic. Um, in any case, I, I found actually knowing what I had written um, 
the way in which it was problematic became much clearer to me. The way in which it's problematic is there's kind of um, a context there which I'm aware of, and maybe other people were aware of, but the people reading Wikipedia wouldn't be. Um, so really what all I'm doing this afternoon is uh, filling in uh, the background to that entry. Um, and this is really, therefore, um, talking about um, what I know about uh, Joseph Needham personally. Uh, and I have to point out at the start that I didn't know him at all well, though I met him a couple of times. Um, one of the times is, is when we had a conversation which is actually the basis of what is written in Wikipedia. The other time, as I point out, um, I was just walking past his institute, which has a statue, it had a statue, it still has a statue of him outside. Um, and um, I was walking past with um, my two little kids and their mother, um, and, and my daughters were very, very young then. And um, I walked past because I was hoping maybe they would be inspired to become academics so they could get statues outside their own institutes. Never worked. Um, but, uh, but I thought, I, you know, that's the stage. You know, the kids are very enough, I'd try it. And anyhow, he, he's inside and he sees me walking past. And I think he recognized my ex wife more than he recognized me because I, he'd worked with her a bit, uh, or she'd worked for him. Um, so he calls us in. And, and so he shows us his wonderful new institute. And, and he's getting on for 90 then, I think it was about 88. Anyhow, he, he, he's a large man, and he looks down at them, and he says, how strange to be so small. <laughs> um, and, and so, you know, apart from what's in Wikipedia, that's about as much as he ever said to me. Um, so I'm not claiming, you know, I'm not claiming to be a Needham expert. And in fact, um, what's interesting is, is that there aren't really Needham experts. There's a popular book by a journalist called Simon Winchester, um, which if you want to know details of his sex life could be useful, but really doesn't grapple with his intellectual significance. But I'm not going to do that either. Um, what I'm going to point out is that um, the conversation we had um, was really um, one that came about because at that time I was trying to learn more about Taoism. Um, I'd been asked to produce some work in that field and I was being helped by Nathan Sivin, who was a friend of Joseph Liebens, who is a, uh, is a historian of, of, of chemistry in China in particular, uh, and uh, he insisted that we should meet. And um, so we did meet, uh, and uh, it was in a tea shop in Bridge Street, in, um, I guess in the late 70s, um, maybe early 80s, I think it was the late 70s. And what I did was I, I, I said to him, surely um, you're underrating Buddhism because even by, by, you know, by say, the 8th century, um, yeah, even the Taoist materials that you're in, interested in are heavily influenced by Buddhism. He said, yeah, you're right. Yeah, I, I'll admit that I, I have underrated Buddhism. But beyond this little conversation, which I, you know, it's repeated in the Wikipedia, or the substance of it, that, that, that he did say, yeah, I have underestimated Buddhism, but the lies a longer story, which, which uh, you know, people in Cambridge, England in the uh, 50s and 60s would know about, but, um, you know, that's not in Wikipedia. What it is, is that obviously uh, what Needham was doing had never been attempted before. Um, a comprehensive uh, investigation of the um, role of science in uh, Chinese civilization, science and technology and medicine. Um, and uh, it, it had his roots in his uh, getting to know a, a, a Chinese scientist in the 1930s, a woman called Lu Guizhen, um, a medical historian um, and researcher, um, and uh, had led him uh, to go to China during the war and uh, form a, a, a first hand knowledge of, of, of Chinese science. Um, but uh, it's quite clear um, from his uh, 
earliest writings that uh, although he's interested in Taoism, um, he thinks that Buddhism did not help the development of Chinese science. Okay, but um, his work, although groundbreaking and very almost universally um, very well received, did attract some criticism. Uh, and it was from someone who I actually knew a lot better than him, a um, historian of China, who was also working in Cambridge, um, whose name was, was Dennis Twitchett, who was the founder, one of the founding editors of the Cambridge History of China. Um, not as famous a figure as, as um, Joseph Needham, but a, a very important figure in Chinese studies, um, mainly a social and economic historian. Now, Dennis Twitchett um, had actually a degree in, in uh, physical geography, and so uh, he had some, um, not a background in science, but he knew some things about agriculture and so forth, uh, that most historians of China in those days in the Western world did not. And so when Needham's volume came out, he was one of the very few um, China historians who really looked at it closely, and his Review, he was working in uh, the institution where I spent most of my career, SOAS, in London uh, at that time, so he published in the Bulletin of SOAS. And um, his review is, of course, respectful, and he says, um, uh, you know, this is the groundbreaking stuff and so forth. Um, because volume one is just introductory and is a sort of um, uh, potted history of Chinese civilization. Um, it, and uh, has some remarks on east-west contacts. And he says, well, the remarks on east-west contacts are actually, you know, more original, but the potted history uh, doesn't add up to much that's new, and uh, it ignores Japanese scholarship, because Dennis Twitchett had um, spent some time in Japan and was pretty well up on that. Okay, that's fine. Um, it was a kind of discordant note for volume one, uh, but but what happened next was that Volume 2 came out, and Volume 2 is about the intellectual orientations in China that, that, that could have been positive factors in the development of scientific thought. And there, um, again, Dennis Twitch is the guy who, who reviews that um, volume. Um, and again, he makes similar points. He says, uh, and I'm much Japanese scholarship here, but he, he's introducing some new um, criticisms. Oh, the first of them is to do with the nature of Needham's reading of philosophical texts. And that's, he doesn't say this guy can't understand Chinese, and I'll explain in a minute um, why he doesn't say that. Um, but he does say, look, Chinese philosophical texts are not easy to construe. Uh, and uh, what, the way you translate them into English doesn't necessarily, um, it's not going to necessarily reflect some of the problems of understanding. Uh, and so just to uh, read off a text and say, well, this supports uh, such and such a, a view of the world, this is um, not a simple matter. But then, uh, after some remarks about that, and um, you get to a passage where um, he's pretty direct. Um, and I'll read it out. In the political field also, the author has done less than justice to the part played by Buddhism in medieval society. It is clear that whereas Dr. Needham is strongly attracted by Taoism, his reaction to Buddhism is not so favorable. While I share this outlook to some extent, the author's contention that in general the Buddhist religion was a negative, if not inhibitory factor in Chinese society and thought, is certainly untrue. So that's a flat out contradiction of Needham's point. Um, and um, he goes on to point to the role of Buddhism in the development of Chinese linguistics, Chinese logic, Chinese mathematics, and also to the role of uh, Chinese monasteries uh, in society. Uh, and he's thinking perhaps of um, technologies like milling and so forth, um, 
which were associated with them. But, but certainly, um, he, he's, he's um, pointing out that there is a big Buddhist-shaped hole um, in, in Needham's work. Um, so, uh, already there's some kind of um, clash shaping up. Um, and um, this is further exacerbated when Volume 3 comes out. Now, Volume 3 will be known to some of you here because it's the one where he starts to work on uh, the history of Chinese astronomy, mathematical astronomy. And there, it's <laughs> the review starts, and again I should quote, um, with the third volume, uh, Dr. Needham's history has at last begun to live up to its promise. It's kind of a backhanded compliment. Um, and um, he, he, he gives full credit to, to what Needham achieves in that volume, but he's still, you know, not too happy with it. And apparently, um, Joseph Needham was not too happy with the review. Um, as I said, my ex-wife worked, worked for him for a while, so I did, I did have to discuss this with her, and she said, well, you know, the guy was probably... I'll, I'll explain a bit more, actually, than what she actually said. The guy was a successful scientist. He, he, he was interested in embryology, and especially the history of embryology. Um, he didn't get a full professorship, but he, but he came, got the next rank down in the British system. Um, and he, he, in Cambridge, where, where the, um, the study of embryology was pretty advanced, so that, 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 that was success. Um, and at the same time, he's doing this pioneering work to do with China. He didn't, you know, he was obviously used to being um, well thought of as a scientist. He became a member of the Royal Society. Um, he wasn't used to criticism at all, especially uh, because his work in China was so unprecedented. So he is, as she said, you know, he, he's used to criticism, so he, you know, he didn't know how to handle it that well. Um, but, but sure enough, I mean, what I have to say is, is um, what I've uh, summed up as, um, in the words of one of my late colleagues, um, when I, I was teaching at Cambridge during the, um, the 19, uh, 1970s, and I was a student there in the 60s. Um, a colleague summed it up, just because there is a Pope in Avignon and a Pope in Rome does not mean that they're not both Pope. In other words, Cambridge was divided between two authority figures. Uh, Needham on the one hand, and, and Twitchett, based in, um, in the, what was then the Faculty of Oriental Studies on the other. And Needham was actually, um, there was no Department of uh, the History of Chinese Science. There was no Needham Research Institute at that stage. Uh, he was actually master of Longville and Keynes College, and that's where he did most of his work uh, from the 60s onwards until the creation of his institute. So there were these two warring camps, as it were, and there was no communication between them. Um, a, I'm, as I say, I'm very grateful, uh, given that I was uh, certainly an undergraduate student at Davis Twitcher, that he should be talking to me at all in a tea shop in Bridge Street. B, I'm very grateful in a way that, that uh, there was this major clash of outlooks. It's, and I say it's a clash of outlooks because there is, again, background to it that, that you wouldn't pick up a media from Wikipedia. Needham is 25 years older than Dennis Twitchin, but he, and, but they are taught by the same guy. He's a middle European sinologist who fled from Europe to escape from Hitler in the late 1930s and became professor at Cambridge. Um, a very obscure figure because he didn't publish much, but it was uh, absolutely crucial that the development of the teaching about China in Cambridge at the time, but a very traditional sinological figure, ancient texts and, and, and textual scholarship about them and, and so on and so forth, a man called Gustav Hallum. Now, um, amongst Stephen's manuscripts, uh, there is um, some record of his teaching by Gustav Hallum. Uh, and it's clear that he found it very inspiring and so on and so forth. Uh, and you can see him, you know, uh, responding to the ideas. But there's also, um, although I don't possess it now, I did see a manuscript of Dennis Twitchett's teaching by Gustav Hallum. Now, Dennis Twitchett was a full-time student um, after the war. 
in Chinese studies and was taught as part of a regular curriculum by Gustav Hollen. And his notes show that certainly as a student, he was extremely thorough. Um, you know, he entered into the uh, sinological work that um, uh, Hollen was doing and um, uh, he learned his lessons well. Um, and you can see that in his notes. It seems to me that there's a kind of tension there between someone who has gone through a thorough training and someone who, however gifted, uh, had not, who had, you know, taken some uh, lessons from along, but it was basically still, uh, in the best possible sense, an amateur. And so one can understand that the older man, um, 25 years older, did feel a certain sense of uh, insecurity in dealing with, uh, with, with criticism from somebody who he knew to be um, better prepared in dealing with Chinese materials than he was. Although, of course, uh, Needham did also rely to a very large extent on uh, Chinese collaborators. Uh, so, what this comes down to is that, um, yes, he realized eventually that um, he had not given Buddhism its due as a source of inspiration in China. But you can see uh, in some of what he published, the way in which this dawned on him. And the way in which it dawned on him can be seen not in the major sinological writings, but in the occasional pieces. I mentioned that he was a master of a Cambridge college. One of the duties of a master of a Cambridge college is to preach in chapel. So some of the writings that um, uh, he produced were actually sermons. And in these, um, obviously as a man with a broad outlook, he is actually much more ecumenical, shall we say, much broader uh, in his ability to uh, appreciate other points of view. Um, not only that, but clearly also as he became more famous in, in, in the 19. 50s, he started to travel more, and amongst the countries he went to was Sri Lanka, and he, he was well received there um, by Buddhist scholars, and he, um, I think what it comes down to is a bit British. Uh, you know, if, if you're brought up properly and people are nice to you, you feel obliged to be nice to them. Uh, so, um, so what one finds is that gradually over the course of time, uh, he has been much more generous towards uh, Buddhist people, and therefore you see that it's um, beginning to uh, come into his writings about things like um, the function of Buddhist monasticism in Chinese society as an agent of change, etc., etc. Um, but still. Um, the effects of the blind spot linger. And now, the area that I'm most familiar with, was, was, and which is the reason why I get into Wikipedia, is to do with the history of printing. Um, but clearly there's a strong link between uh, the uh, creation of woodblock printing and uh, Buddhist ideas. Um, partly, I think it's important to see this because you have to see uh, that unlike Europe, the introduction of printing was not the outcome of, as it was in Europe, of a desire for more books. We know uh, from the records in Chinese that there were hundreds of thousands of manuscripts in China in the, say, the seventh century, the century before there's actual physical evidence of printing. Nobody wanted more books. Uh, most of the books were Buddhists too. That is also quite explicit. But the numbers of Buddhist books far outweigh the number of, say, Confucian classics. Um, so the motives for introducing printing didn't exist in the same way as Europe. However, if they are Buddhist texts, uh, and this is my interpretation, it's not one that I think 
everybody would agree with, but it's 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 certainly the way I was uh, I've come to look at it. Um, if you see the Buddha's word as an instantiation of the presence of the Buddha, the ability to multiply that as a certain political function in justifying ideologically um, the position of the regime in China. Um, and that this uh, provides a motive for the uh, use of printing technology that has nothing to do with the rather practical um, motives that are usually ascribed to it in Europe. Um, and therefore you have to understand the re religious ideology and the religious motivations that lie behind it. Um, but, um, but that's maybe a special case. But obviously, you know, I could go on all afternoon, and I haven't got all afternoon, about other areas where I think um, you know, there are blind spots in, the, in Joseph Smeedon's work that could, that could be addressed, and indeed some, some, some of the scholars here are addressing now. But there's just one where I, I, I thought I would use as an example, and that is the history of Buddhism and oral hygiene. Okay. You may think it's a minor matter, but actually, uh, in, in terms of health education, Buddhism had an extraordinarily important function in introducing, um, especially the tooth stick, which is somewhere in between a toothpick and a toothbrush, but is used for cleaning the teeth. And it is frequently mentioned in Buddhist monastic sources, it's in thin air, uh, a lot of these materials are in Chinese. Um, and, um, Anne Hammond, who has worked in this kind of area recently, with a colleague, shows that uh, not only do, can you see that this is an important element in, in, in the video, it's picked up in China, uh, but it also, it had an impact outside Buddhism in China, it also gets into Taoist sources, and Taoists also recommend oral hygiene um, in their texts as well. Um, but Needham picks up the importance of oral hygiene, but all he says is, oh, there's a picture of a guy in a mural from, from I think it's the 8th century, um, you know, using one of these tooth sticks. So there we are. That's a Buddhist element to it. But a lot remains to be written. He didn't look at the Buddhist sources at all, even when there are references to, to this use of, of um, oral hygiene um, in translating Buddhist sources. That had been noticed by other scholars working in France as early as the 19th, end of the 19th century. So what I'm saying is that, uh, what I'm recommending to all of you is that if you're interested in the historical dimensions of the interface between Buddhism and technology in East Asia, then there is everything to play for in this area. There is research that is starting to be done. One thinks of Buddhism and medicine, for example, and the examples you're about to hear about uh, the importance of um, Buddhism in the field of astronomy and so forth. But there's a lot more that, that remains to be done because it was a kind of blind spot to this, this amazing first generation uh, pioneering figure. And um, so that's the only reason why um, I decided it was time that, you know, I, I ought to explore uh, some of the um, uh, further ramifications of the few remarks there are with my name attached in Wikipedia. Um, obviously, um, I would be very happy to go on and discuss um, any amount of the questions that this raised, but, but, but uh, I just thought I'd say that much as the uh, uh, Introductions of this, what I'm sure is going to be a wonderful con conference. Thank you very much for listening to me.